John Hutchins Tyndall, July 14, 1934 July 19, 2005, was a British fascist political activist. A leading member of various small neo Nazi groups during the late 1950s and 1960s, he was chairman of the National Front from 1972 to 1974 and again from 1975 to 1980, and then chairman of the British National Party from 1982 to 1999. He unsuccessfully stood for election to the House of Commons and European Parliament on several occasions. Born in Devon and educated in Kent, Tyndall undertook national service prior to embracing the extreme right. In the mid-1950s, he joined the League of Empire Loyalists, LEL, and came under the influence of its leader, Arthur Chesterton. Finding the LEL too moderate, in 1957 he and John Bean founded the National Labour Party, NLP, an explicitly national socialist, Nazi, group. In 1960, the NLP merged with Colin Jordan's White Defence League to found the first British National Party, BNP, with Tyndall and Jordan establishing a paramilitary wing called Spearhead. Bean and other BNP members were unhappy with this and expelled Tyndall and Jordan, who went on to establish the National Socialist Movement and then the wider World Union of National Socialists. In 1962, they were convicted and briefly imprisoned for their paramilitary activities. After a split with Jordan, Tyndall formed his Greater Britain Movement, GBM, in 1964. Although never changing his basic beliefs, by the mid-1960s, Tyndall was replacing his overt references to Nazism with appeals to British nationalism. In 1967, Tyndall joined Chesterton's National Front, NF, and became leader in 1972. His leadership of the NF was threatened by various factions within the party which eventually led to him losing his position as leader in 1974. He resumed this position in 1975, although the latter part of the 1970s saw the party's prospects decline. Following an argument with long-term comrade Martin Webster, Tyndall resigned from the party in 1980 and formed his short-lived New National Front, NNF. In 1982, he merged the NNF into his own newly formed British National Party, BNP. Under Tyndall, the BNP established itself as the UK's most prominent extreme right group during the 1980s, although electoral success eluded it. Tyndall's refusal to moderate the party's policies or image caused anger among a growing array of modernizers in the party, who ousted him in favor of Nick Griffin in 1999. In 2005, Tyndall was charged with incitement to racial hatred for comments made at a BNP meeting. He died two days before his trial was due to take place. Tyndall promoted a racial nationalist belief in a distinct white British race arguing that this race was threatened by a Jewish conspiracy to encourage non-white migration into Britain. He called for the establishment of an authoritarian state which would deport all non-whites from the country, engage in a eugenics project, and re-establish the British Empire through the military conquest of parts of Africa. He never gained any mainstream political respectability in the United Kingdom although proved popular among sectors of the British far-right. Early Life Youth, 1934-58 John Tyndall was born at Stork Nest, Top Sham Road in Exeter, Devon, on July 14, 1934. His mother was Nellie Tyndall, née Parker, his father was George Francis Tyndall. Through the Tyndall family line he was related to both the early English translator of the Bible, William Tyndall, and the physicist John Tyndall. His paternal family were British Unionists living in County Waterford, Ireland, who had a long line of service in the Royal Irish Constabulary. His grandfather had been a district inspector in the Constabulary and had fought against the Irish Republican forces in the country's War of Independence. His father had moved to England, working as a Metropolitan Police Officer, and then as a Warden of St George's House, 
a YMCA hostel in Southwark. Tyndall later stated that despite his father having been raised in a British Unionist family, the latter had adopted internationalist views. He claimed that his mother exhibited a kind of basic British patriotism and that it was she who shaped his early political views. His upbringing was emotionally stable and materially secure. Tyndall studied at Beckenham and Penge Grammar School in West Kent, where he attained 3 O-levels, a moderate result. At the school, his achievements had been sporting rather than academic, for he enjoyed playing cricket and association football and developed a passion for fitness. Tyndall did his national service in West Germany from 1952 to 1954. A member of the Royal Horse Artillery, he achieved the rank of Lance Bombardier. On completion, he returned to Britain and turned his attention to political issues. Initially interested in socialism, he attended a World Youth Festival held in the Soviet Union in 1957. He nevertheless began to regard left-wing politics as being infused with anti-British attitudes, moving swiftly to the political right. He had a devotion to the preservation of the British Empire and a hostility to what he regarded as the growing permissiveness of British society, stating that the smell everywhere was one of decadence. During that decade he read Mein Kampf, the autobiography and political manifesto of the late Nazi leader Adolf Hitler, growing sympathetic to Hitler's own political beliefs and Nazism. Tyndall approved in particular of the descriptions of the workings of certain Jewish forces in Germany, which seemed uncannily similar to what I had observed of the same kinds of forces in Britain. He concluded that Britain's decision to go to war against Nazi Germany was ultimately the result of a conspiracy headed primarily by Jews, a conspiracy which he thought had also masterminded non-white immigration into Britain after the war. Around 1957-58, Tyndall decided to commit full-time to his political cause, something enabled by the fact that his job as a salesman allowed him flexible working hours. He decided against joining the union movement led by prominent British fascist Oswald Mosley, disagreeing with its promotion of the political union of Britain with continental Europe. Instead he was attracted to the League of Empire Loyalists, LEL, a right-wing group founded by Arthur Chesterton after seeing coverage of one of their demonstrations on television. He visited their basement office in Westminster, where he was given some of their literature. He enjoyed Chesterton's writings and concurred with his conspiracy theory that Jewish people had been plotting to bring down the British Empire. Tyndall began associating with other young men who had joined the LEL. At a February 1957 by-election in Lewisham North, Tyndall aided the LEL campaign, during which he met fellow party member John Bean, an industrial chemist. Both Tyndall and Bean were frustrated by the LEL's attempts to exert pressure on the mainstream Conservative Party. They wanted to be involved in a more radical party, one that would combine nationalism with popular socialism and which would reach out to the white working class through appeals against immigration from the Caribbean. The National Labour Party and the First British National Party, 1958-62 in April 1958, Tyndall and Bean founded their own extreme right group, the National Labour Party, NLP. The group was based at Thornton Heath, Croydon, and attracted its early membership from former LEL members living in South and East London. According to the historian Richard Thurlow, the NLP promoted an English variant of Nazism, and was more pronounced in its explicit racism than the LEL had been focusing less on bemoaning the decline of the British Empire and more on criticizing the arrival of non-white immigrants from former British colonies. The NLP began co-operating with another extreme right group, the White Defense League, which had been established by Colin Jordan, a secondary school teacher. Together the two groups embarked on a project of stirring up racial tensions among white Britons and black Caribbean immigrants in Notting Hill. Tyndall briefly left the NLP, and in his absence Bean and Jordan merged their respective groups into the British National Party, BNP, in 1960. The BNP were racial nationalists, 
calling for the preservation of a Nordic race of which the British race was considered a branch by removing both immigrants and Jewish influences from Britain. Tyndall soon joined this new BNP, and became a close confidant of Jordan, who helped Tyndall to further embrace neo-Nazism. Tyndall also developed a friendship with Martin Webster, who became a long-term comrade after watching Tyndall speak at a Trafalgar Square rally in 1962. In April 1961, Tyndall self-published his pamphlet, The Authoritarian State, Its Meaning and Function, which helped to cement his reputation within the British far right. In the pamphlet, he attacked democratic systems of government as part of a conspiracy orchestrated by Jews, quoting from the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It called for the replacement of the United Kingdom's liberal democratic system with an authoritarian one in which a leader is given absolute power. Within the BNP, Tyndall established an elite group known as Spearhead, members of which wore military-style uniforms inspired by those of the Nazis and underwent paramilitary and ideological training. Tyndall had a great liking for wearing jackboots, Jordan related that on the way to a far-right meeting in Germany, Tyndall made his entourage look for a shoe shop so that he could purchase a pair of genuine German jackboots. It is likely that there were no more than 60 members of Spearhead. The group campaigned on behalf of imprisoned Nazi war criminals Rudolf Hess and Adolf Eichmann. According to the anti-fascist activist Gary Gable, Spearhead represented the first terrorist group founded by neo-Nazis in Britain. Both Bean and another senior BNP member, Andrew Fountaine, were concerned about the overt neo-Nazism embraced by Tyndall and Jordan, instead thinking that the BNP should articulate a more British-oriented form of racial nationalism. In 1962, Bean held a meeting at which Tyndall and Jordan were expelled from the party. The National Socialist Movement and Greater Britain Movement, 1962-67 Tyndall and Jordan then regrouped around 20 members of Spearhead and formed the National Socialist Movement, NSM, on April 20, 1962, a date symbolically chosen as the anniversary of Hitler's birthday. They celebrated the event with a cake decorated with a Nazi swastika. According to the historian Richard Thurlow, the NSM was the most blatant Nazi group active in Britain during the mid-20th century. The NSM gained few members, an estimate in August 1962 suggested that it had only 30 to 50. The NSM gained the attention of the media as well as special branch. In July 1962, Tyndall was arrested for breaching the peace at a Trafalgar Square rally in which he had been attacked by Jewish military veterans and other anti-fascists after calling the Jewish community a poisonous maggot feeding on a body in an advanced state of decay. His comments resulted in him being convicted of inciting racial hatred and he was sentenced to six weeks imprisonment, reduced to a fine on appeal. The police then raided the group's London headquarters, after which its leading members were brought to trial at the Old Bailey, where they were found guilty of establishing a paramilitary group in contravention of Section 2 of the Public Order Act 1936. Tyndall received a six-month prison sentence while Jordan received nine months. Although the British authorities had prohibited the American neo-Nazi George Lincoln Rockwell from entering the UK, the NSM managed to smuggle him in via Ireland to attend a summer camp in August 1962. There, the NSM took part in the formation of the World Union of National Socialists WUNS, at which Jordan was elected World Führer and Rockwell as his heir. Among those in attendance were the neo-Nazi Savitri Devi and the former SS officer Fred Borth. Jordan had been courting the French socialite Françoise Dior, but while he had been imprisoned, she entered a relationship with Tyndall and they were engaged to be married. On Jordan's release, Dior left Tyndall and instead married Jordan in October 1963. This contributed to a growing personal feud between the two men with Jordan accusing Tyndall and Webster of making obscene phone calls to Dior. Tyndall was also angry at what he perceived as Jordan's deviation from orthodox Nazi thought, 
and by the fact that Jordan's relationship with Dior had been attracting negative sensationalist press attention for the NSM. In the spring of 1964 Tyndall and Webster tried to oust Jordan as the head of the NSM but failed. In later years Tyndall expressed the view that his involvement in the NSM had been a profound mistake, arguing that then he still had a lot to learn and that when one sees one's nation and people in danger there is less dishonor in acting and acting wrongly than in not acting at all. Now based in Battersea, Tyndall left Jordan and the NSM and formed his own rival, the Greater Britain Movement, GBM. According to Tyndall, the Greater Britain Movement will uphold, and preach, pure national socialism. According to the political scientist Stan Taylor, the GBM reflected Tyndall's desire for a specifically British variant of national socialism. It called for the criminalization of sexual relations and marriages between white Britons and non-whites and called for the sterilization of those it deemed unfit to reproduce. The group established its base in a rundown building in Notting Hill, with swastikas being sprayed onto the exterior and an image of Hitler decorating the interior. Tyndall tried to convince the WUNS to accept his GBM as its British representative, but Rockwell concerned not to encourage schismatic dissenters in his own American Nazi party sided with Jordan and the NSM. Tyndall then established contact with Rockwell's main rival in the American neo-Nazi scene, the National States Rights Party. Tyndall also launched a new magazine, which he titled Spearhead, and a publishing company called Albion Press. According to the historian Alan Sykes, this magazine became increasingly influential in the British far right. Much of the material that Tyndall wrote for the journal was less openly neo-Nazi and extreme than his previous writings something which may have resulted from caution surrounding the Race Relations Act 1965. The GBM engaged in several stunts to raise publicity, in 1964 for instance Webster assaulted the Kenyan leader Yomo Kenyatta outside his London hotel while Tyndall hurled insults at him through a loudspeaker. In 1965, the group staged a shooting incident at its Norwood headquarters, claiming that it had been an attack by anti-fascists. In another instance they distributed stickers emblazoned with a portrait of Hitler and the slogan He Was Right. In 1966, several GBM members were arrested for carrying out arson attacks against synagogues. Later Career The National Front, 1967-80 In the mid-1960s, there were five extreme right groups operating in Britain, and Tyndall believed that they could achieve more if they united. To that end, Spearhead abandoned its open affiliation with neo-Nazism in early 1966. That year, Tyndall issued a pamphlet titled Six Principles of British Nationalism which made no mention of neo-Nazism or Jewish conspiracies. It also dropped the insistence on armed takeovers present in his earlier thought acknowledging the possibility that extreme-right nationalists could gain power through the British electoral process. Chesterton read the pamphlet and was impressed, entering into talks with Tyndall's GBM about a potential merger of their respective organizations. Independently, Chesterton had also been discussing the issue of a unification with Bean's BNP. This proved successful, as the LEL and BNP merged to form the National Front, NF, in 1967. According to Thurlow, the formation of the NF was the most significant event on the radical right and fascist fringe of British politics since the internment of the country's fascists during the Second World War. The new NF initially excluded Tyndall and his GBM from joining, concerned that he might seek to mold it in a specifically neo-Nazi direction although they soon agreed to allow both him and other GBM members to join on probation. On entering, the former GBM soon became the most influential faction within the NF, with many of its members rapidly rising to positions of influence. Tyndall became the party's vice-chairman and remained loyal to Chesterton, who was the party's first chairman, for instance by supporting him when several members of the party directorate rebelled against his leadership in 1970. Although remaining Tyndall's private property, 
Spearhead became the de facto monthly magazine of the NF. Chesterton resigned as chairman in 1970, and was replaced by the Powell Light John O'Brien. In 1972, O'Brien and eight other members of the party's directorate resigned in protest at Tyndall's links to neo-Nazi groups in Germany. This allowed Tyndall to take control as party chairman in 1972. According to Thurlow, under Tyndall the NF represented an attempt to portray the essentials of Nazi ideology in more rational language and seemingly reasonable arguments, functioning as an attempt to convert racial populists angry about immigration into fascists. Capitalizing on anger surrounding the arrival of Ugandan Asian migrants in the country in 1972, Tyndall oversaw the NF during the period of its largest growth. Membership of the party doubled between October 1972 and June 1973, possibly reaching as high as 17,500. Relations had apparently warmed between Tyndall and Jordan, for they met up after the latter was released from prison in 1968, and Tyndall again met with Jordan in Coventry in 1972 and invited him to join the NF. A poor showing in the February 1974 general election resulted in Tyndall being challenged by two groups within the party, the Strasserites and the Populists, the latter of whom were largely Powell Light ex-members of the Conservative Party. The Populist challenge was successful and in October 1974 Tyndall was replaced as chairman by John Kingsley Reed. Tyndall then used Spearhead as a vehicle to criticize rival factions with the NF. As a result, he was expelled from the party during a disciplinary tribunal in November 1975. Tyndall took the issue to the High Court, who overturned the expulsion. The populists then left the party, splitting to form the National Party in January 1976, which for a short time proved more electorally successful than the NF. Back in the party and with his main rivals gone, Tyndall regained the position of chairman. Encouraged by Webster and new confidant Richard Verrill, in the mid-1970s Tyndall returned to his openly hardline approach of promoting biological racist and anti-Semitic ideas. This did not help the NF's electoral prospects. In the 1979 general election, the NF mounted the largest challenge of any insurgent party since the Labour Party in 1918, with 303 candidates. Among them were Tyndall's wife, mother-in-law, and father-in-law. Tyndall stood in Hackney South and Shoreditch, securing 7.6%, this was the front's best result that election, but was down from the 9.4% they had gained in that constituency in October 1974. In the election, the NF flopped dismally, securing only 1.3% of the total vote, down from 3.1% in October 1974. This decline may have been due to the increased anti-fascist campaigning of the previous few years, or because the Conservative Party under Margaret Thatcher had adopted an increasingly tough stance on immigration which attracted many of the votes that had previously gone to the NF. NF membership had also declined, and by 1979 had fallen to approximately 5,000. Tyndall nevertheless refused to dilute or moderate his party's policies, stating that to do so would be the naive chasing of moonbeams. In November 1979, Fountaine unsuccessfully tried to oust Tyndall as leader, subsequently establishing the National Front Constitutional Movement. Tyndall had grown distant from Webster over a number of differences, and in the late 1970s began blaming him for the party's problems. Webster had for instance disagreed with Tyndall's support for Chesterton's leadership, while Tyndall was upset with Webster's attempts to encourage more skinheads and football hooligans to join the party. Tyndall in particular began criticizing the fact that Webster was a homosexual, emphasizing allegations that Webster had been making sexual advances toward young men in the party. More widely, he complained about a homosexual network among leading NF members. 
In October 1979 he called a meeting of the NF Directorate at which he urged them to call for Webster's resignation. At the meeting Webster apologized for his conduct, and the Directorate stood by him against Tyndall. Angered, Tyndall then tried convincing the Directorate to grant him greater powers in his position as chairman, but they refused. Tyndall resigned in January 1980, subsequently referring to the party as the Gay National Front. In June 1980, Tyndall founded the new National Front, NNF. The NNF claimed that a third of the NF's membership defected to join them. Tyndall stated that I have one wish in this operation and one wish alone, to cleanse the National Front of the foul stench of perversion which has politically crippled it. As his choice of party name suggested, he remained hopeful that his breakaway group could eventually be remerged back into the NF. There developed a great rivalry between the two groups, and as the NF's new leadership moved it away from the Tyndall Light approach, Tyndall realized that he may never have the opportunity to regain his position within it. Establishing the British National Party, 1981 89. In January 1981, Tyndall was contacted by far-right activist Ray Hill, who had become an informant for the anti-fascist magazine Searchlight. Hill suggested that Tyndall establish a new political party through which he could unite many smaller extreme-right groups. While Hill's real intention had been to cause a further schism among the British far-right and thus weaken it, Tyndall deemed his suggestion to be a good idea. Tyndall made suggestions of unity to a number of other small extreme right groups and together they established a Committee for Nationalist Unity, CNU, in January 1982. In March 1982 the CNU held a conference at Charing Cross Hotel in central London, and while the NF officially refused to send a delegation, several NF members did attend. The 50 extreme rightists in attendance agreed that they would establish a new political party, to be known as the British National Party, BNP. According to Tyndall, the BNP is a racial nationalist party which believes in Britain for the British, that is to say racial separatism. Under Tyndall's leadership, in 1982 the BNP issued its first policy on immigration as immigration into Britain by non-Europeans should be terminated forthwith, and we should organize a massive program of repatriation and resettlement overseas of those peoples of non-European origin already resident in this country. Tyndall was to be the leader of this new party, with the majority of its members coming from the NNF, although others were defectors from the NF, British Movement, British Democratic Party, and Nationalist Party. The party was formerly launched at a press conference held in a Victoria hotel on April 7, 1982. At the conference, Tyndall described the BNP as the SDP of the far right, thereby referencing the recent growth of the centrist Social Democratic Party. The historian Nigel Copsey has noted that while the BNP under Tyndall could be described as neo-Nazi, it was not crudely mimetic of the original German Nazism. Its stated policy objectives were identical to those that the NF had had under Tyndall's leadership in the 1970s. But its constitution was very different. Whereas the NF had a directorate which helped to guide the direction of the party and could replace the leader, Tyndall's new BNP gave full executive powers to the chairman. Tyndall ran the BNP from his home, Seacroft, in Hove, East Sussex and he rarely left the county. In 1986 Tyndall was convicted of inciting racial hatred and sentenced to a year's imprisonment, although he served only four months before his release. In 1987, the BNP opened discussions with an NF faction, the National Front Support Group, NFSG, to discuss the possibility of a merger, but the NFSG decided against it remaining cautious about Tyndall's total domination of the BNP. By 1988, Searchlight reported that the party's membership had declined to around 1,000. Tyndall responded by trying to raise finances, calling for greater sales of their newspaper and increasing the price of membership by 50%. 
He also promised that he would make the BNP the largest extreme right group in the UK and that he would establish a professional headquarters for the party. This was achieved in 1989, as a party headquarters was opened in Welling, South East London, an area chosen because it was a recipient of significant white flight from inner London. That year also witnessed the BNP become the most prominent force on the British far right as the NF collapsed amid internal arguments and schisms. Growth of the British National Party, 1990-99 In the early 1990s, a paramilitary group known as Combat 18, C18, was formed to protect BNP events from anti-fascist protesters. Tyndall was displeased that by 1992, C-18 was having an increased influence over the BNP street activities. Relations between the groups deteriorated such that by August 1993, activists from the BNP and C-18 were physically fighting each other. In December 1993, Tyndall issued a bulletin to BNP branches declaring C-18 to be a proscribed organization, furthermore suggesting that it may have been established by agents of the state to discredit the party. To counter C-18's influence, he secured the American white nationalist militant William Pierce as a guest speaker at the BNP's annual rally in November 1995. Tyndall had observed the electoral success achieved by Jean-Marie L. E. Penn and the French National Front during the 1980s, and hoped that by learning from their activities he could improve the BNP's electoral prospects. He saw the issue as being one of credibility among the electorate, declaring that we should be looking for ways to overcome our present image of weakness and smallness. He ignored the significant impact that had been achieved by the French NF through moderating its policies and thereby gaining greater respectability among the electorate. While Tyndall had sought to keep skinheads and football hooligans out of the BNP, he still kept a range of Holocaust deniers and convicted criminals close to him. He expressed the view that we should not be looking for ways of applying ideological cosmetic surgery to ourselves in order to make our features more appealing to our public. Conversely, in the early 1990s a modernizer faction emerged in the party that favored a more electorally palatable strategy and an emphasis on building grassroots support to win local elections. They were impressed by L. E. Penn's move to disassociate his party from biological racism and focus on the perceived cultural incompatibility of different racial groups. Tyndall opposed many of the modernizers' ideas and sought to stem their growing influence in the party. In the 1992 general election, the party stood 13 candidates. Tyndall stood in Bow and Poplar, gaining 3% of the vote. At the 1993 local elections, the BNP gained one council seat won by Derek Beacon in the East London neighbourhood of Millwall after a campaign that targeted the anger of local whites over the perceived preferential treatment received by Bangladeshi migrants in social housing. At the time Tyndall described this as the BNP's moment in history, deeming it a sign that the party was entering the political mainstream. Following an anti-BNP campaign launched by anti-fascist and local religious groups it lost its Millwall seat during the 1994 local elections. Tyndall stood as the BNP candidate in the 1994 Dagenham by-election, in which he gained 9% of the vote and had his electoral deposit returned. This was the first time that an extreme right candidate had retained their deposit since Webster's 1973 showing for the NF in West Bromwich. In the 1997 general election, the party stood over 50 candidates. Tyndall stood in the East London constituency of Poplar and Canning Town, where he received 7.26% of the vote. Tyndall claimed that following the election, the party received between 2,500 and 3,000 inquiries roughly the same as they had received after the 1983 general election although far fewer of these inquirers became members. The party was stagnating, and Tyndall's political career was now on borrowed time. After the BNP's poor performance at the 1997 general election, opposition to Tyndall's leadership grew. His position was damaged by a lack of financial transparency in the party, 
with concerns being raised that large donations to the party had been used instead by Tyndall for personal expenses. The modernizers challenged his control of the party, resulting in its first ever leadership election, held in October 1999. Tyndall was challenged by Nick Griffin, who offered an improved administration, financial transparency and greater support for local branches. 80% of party members voted, with two-thirds backing Griffin, Tyndall had secured only 411 votes, representing 30% of the total membership. Please subscribe and thanks for watching.